but we only treated it once. And six or seven years later, we got to thinking, hmm, maybe we should use this stuff. <laughs> and so started burning it in a car and it ran just fine. You, you no literally issues. just took that old gas that had been sitting there for six or seven years and dumped it into your car? Yeah. The Ready Life into the country. Hi, I'm Lisa. And I'm Nick Meisner. And we want to welcome you back to the Ready Life podcast, where we show you how to make your home as independent as possible for things like water, power, heat, and food, the basic necessities of life. Today, we're going to be talking about long-term fuel storage. Now, I realize fuel is not exactly the most independent source of energy, but it sure is convenient for some of the things that we like to use, like our small engine tools, like chainsaws and uh, splitters, or trying to think off the top of my of head. Yeah, <laughs> lots of different things that we can use fuel for. We could do and without even, it, right? Yeah, we could do without it with a little bit of elbow grease, maybe. But <laughs> with a lot, you mean? <laughs> uh, yeah, with a lot of elbow grease. <laughs> but it sure is convenient to have it. So we're going to talk about ways that we can store fuel for longer term. Because that's the thing about fuel and kind of meshing fuel and independence is if we're, if we're wanting to be able to use fuel, then but yet we want to be independent as independent as possible, then we're going to need to be able to store it. And if you've had any experience with fuel storage, you know that fuel can go bad very quickly. So that's what this podcast is all about. How that's do we do right. that? That's right. How can we store fuel? Long term. So what are the key factors that affect fuel storage? Well, the storage conditions that are the conditions that the fuel is being stored in. So first of all, you want the fuel to be cool in a nice cool place, a place also that's dry where there isn't moisture. And then also you want to have a stable temperature. You don't want lots of fluctuation in the temperature. Right. That's right. So when we're looking at storing fuel, we want to try and keep those three things in mind as much as possible. Stable temperature, no moisture or as little moisture as possible in the surrounding atmosphere. Certainly no direct exposure to moisture. Yeah. And also as cool as possible. And that would be ideal. Not always possible to do that, but we want to try at least. Um, so Thinking about containers, what kind of container do we want to use for fuel storage? I like larger containers better because the smaller the container is, the less thermal mass, you might say, there is. And so there's going to be a lot more fluctuation with the temperature. It's easier to warm it up or cool it down. <laughs> right. And it's just doing that every day. So when you've got it in a five-gallon container, let's say, there's going to be a lot more fluctuation than there is in a 55-gallon drum or especially like a 300-gallon tank or something like that. So larger is better. It just seems like fuel doesn't go bad as quickly when it's in a larger container. That's been my personal experience, at least. So um, we've used 55-gallon drums a lot. They're, I guess the thing that I like about them is it's a larger container, but yet it's still feasible to move the thing around. When you've got one of these big 300-gallon fuel storage tanks, and I'm just picking 300 gallons, there's a variety of sizes out there, but when you've got one of these really large fuel tanks, you don't move that thing around when it's full of fuel. And so that's the thing about 55-gallon drums is it gives you some kind of a good blend of those two, movability, and yet it's still larger. And but even in spite of that, even if it, even if you've done everything just right, you've got it in a larger container, say 55 gallon drums, you've made sure that it's under shelter, um, that it's you know not exposed to moisture, that it's off the ground. That's another thing is, is you don't want to really set these tanks on the ground. You'd like to keep them off the ground, set them on some blocks or something like that. And even if you've kept it out of sunlight, which would be a really good idea, all of these things, in spite of that, fuel only lasts so long when it's as is. 
I mean, it could be as short as a month or two even. Hmm. I think most of the time, it's if it's in a larger container, it's probably going to go a little further than that. But it all depends. I mean, it depends on how long it was sitting in the tank there at the gas station where you filled up. Hmm. And so that's that's an argument in favor of getting your gas from a station that's busy because they're going to have fresher fuel. A lot of t- fuel, turnover. A lot of turnover, hmm. right. So, But even still, it's still going to go bad in a relatively short period of time. And so that's where we need to treat the fuel with a stabilizer. And stabilizers are just amazing if you use a good one. And this is, now I I must say, all that we're talking about with fuel storage and stabilizing and all of these kinds of things, this is true for like gasoline, diesel, um, kerosene, any of these kinds of fuels, but it's not true for propane. Propane doesn't go bad. So that's a definitely a, a major advantage with propane is it just it doesn't go bad. Propane also has some disadvantages, but that's the big advantage for for propane. So how do we stabilize our gasoline or diesel, whatever it is that we're storing? What kind of stabilizer do we use? Well, I would say forget about the the conventional stabilizers that you find at the big box stores. The brand name that comes to my mind is Stabil. There's others too. I have heard of very poor results from a lot of these. Maybe there's some good ones that are in the stores there. I don't know. I'm just going to speak from personal experience about, and I've mentioned this before, so if you've been listening to the podcast, you've probably heard me mention this before. And No, I do not own stock and Power Research Incorporated or anything <laughs> like that. I've just used the product and it's really good stuff. And so this is what I can tell you works. It's uh, made by Power Research Incorporated. They built their products for preserving, or at least the way they started out was with preserving massive amounts of fuel for these huge tanker ships that come into port and they've got just enormous I don't even know how big the tanks are but they got to preserve the fuel and it could sit there for a while and so they built uh, stabilizers for that kind of scenario probably started out with the PRID and then also added PRIG and so PRIG is for gasoline PRID is for diesel and when I say that we've personally used the stuff, it's been for, let's see, 20, 30, 30 years that we've been using PRI, well, 25 years, let's say 25 years, something like that. Anyway, we've been using it for a while. And when we first started using it, we put it to the test where we were storing several 55 gallon drums in a hot and humid climate, which is not good conditions. It was in a storage unit that got hot as blazes during the summer, and it was in the south. Where I was about to say, was that down in Georgia? It was. <laughs> it sounds like you're describing Georgia it to me. It was <laughs> down south. And we stabilized it once. We, we treated it, the fuel, with PRIG once. And you're supposed to retreat it every 18 months, I believe, but we only treated it once. And six or seven years later, we got to thinking, hmm, maybe we should use this stuff. <laughs> and so started burning it in a car, and it ran just fine. You you no literally issues. just took that old gas that had been sitting there for six or seven years and dumped it into your car? Yeah. Boy, you had a lot of faith. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, I can tell you that the stuff plum works. And we were really impressed with it. And so ever since then, we've been using it and... Every time I fill up my truck with diesel, I use PRID in it just in case it's going to be sitting for a while. And it's got some other advantages too. So it's really good stuff. I, I don't want to turn this into a commercial for PRI, but I'm just saying <laughs> this is this is the stuff that we use for fuel storage. If Don't neglect the other stuff that we're mentioning because PRI is not a silver bullet, but it's going to be a huge tool in your arsenal for fuel storage. So what if... What if I have some gas that's been sitting around for a little while and it's probably gone bad? Can the PRI stuff 
I don't know. Can it help with anything like that? That is one area that I don't have personal experience with. The company claims that you can. In fact, they mm -hmm. say that they've gone out to junkyards and gotten fuel that was like 10 or 15 years old and treated it with PRI, and they claim that it brought it back to within specs where you could actually use it. Wow. Okay. Which is pretty impressive, but I, I can't vouch for that myself because I haven't tried that and don't have any desire to. <laughs> <laughs> I like, I say an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. But the way that you use this stuff is it's really concentrated. One ounce of it treats 16 gallons. So whatever you're using, whether it's PRI or whether you've got something else that you like better, you want to add it to the container before you fill it up, add it to the bottom, and then fill it up. And that makes sure that it mixes really, really well throughout the whole tank. If for whatever reason you already have a tank of fuel that you're wanting to treat, maybe you didn't know about fuel stabilizers or you forgot to use it or whatever, it is possible to treat it after the fact, add the appropriate amount, and then you're going to need to do something to stir it up, to stir up the tank. Drive over a bumpy road. <laughs> yeah. Well, but I'm talking like a 55-gallon drum of fuel or something oh, like that, not yeah. necessarily a tank in your car. And so for that, you know, there's there's a bunch of different ways that you could do this. But one option is to take a hose, run it down to the bottom of the tank, and then blow into it or shoot compressed air into that hose or something to create a bunch of bubbles. And the bubbles can, you know, as they go from the bottom of the tank up to the top, that can help to it stir up. it up and, yeah, mix it up, that sort of thing. So the point is, though, to distribute it, mix it really well. And I still like the back of the truck thing. Just <laughs> put the dr drum of fuel in the back of the truck and strap it in real good and then yeah. go on a... <laughs> That'll do it. A backcountry road. There you go. That'll <laughs> mix it. it up. <laughs> yep, that's right. That's right. But you're like I mentioned earlier, you're supposed to retreat every 18 months with the PRI. At least that's what they told us back in the day. I was looking for that on their website recently, and I didn't find it, but I still think it's a good idea to retreat it every 18 months. If you're using something else, use whatever their instructions are for retreating. But that's basically it. And then that's where the other factors, the environmental factors really come in about trying to keep it as cool as you can, as dry as you can, and as stable as you can temperature wise. And, and that's pretty much it. But there are a few tips that we wanted to bring up about mm. fuel storage, right? Yeah. So the first one is don't use gas that has ethanol in it. Right? Yeah, we use non-ethanol for any yeah. of our small engines. If I was storing a lot of fuel that was going to run in the car, then I'd just have to weigh the cost difference. I wouldn't be as concerned about it in the car. I don't feel like it's as big of a deal, but any of our small engines, generator, chainsaw, mm -hmm. chipper, uh, what other stuff do we, you know, any of that kind of stuff. We run only non-ethanol for a variety of reasons, and I'm not going to get into all of them, but for one thing, at least what as far as it affects fuel storage, ethanol absorbs far more moisture than gasoline does. And so if you're having fuel that's sitting around for years, over time, that ethanol is going to potentially introduce more and more moisture into your fuel, which is not hmm. going to be helpful from a fuel storage standpoint. And just another quickie, just from a two-stroke standpoint, with, with gasoline that you're going to be adding two-stroke mix to for your chainsaw or things like that, uh, I've recently read on uh, Husqvarna's website that they say that ethanol will not bind with the oil mixture, the two-stroke mm. oil. They say it'll bind with, the two-stroke oil will bind with the gasoline, but not with the ethanol. ethanol. And so if mm. you've got 10 or 20% ethanol in there, then that's 10 or 20% of it that the oil is not binding to, and that's 10 or 20% of it that is not lubricating the engine as Thanks. it was designed to be lubricated. So anyhow, just a little bit of, of info about non-ethanol, why we do that, why we go ahead and pay the extra. We have found 
a number of gas stations in the area that have non-ethanol premium. Mm. It's almost always premium. That's the only way that you find non-ethanol is is premium. So you are going to pay a premium for it. Yeah. Unfortunately, but that's the way it is. You know, small engines don't usually use a lot of gas, and I think it's worth it. So another tidbit that I would mention regarding fuel storage is with any of your small engines that have carburetors, if they're going to sit for more than a couple of weeks, I would definitely suggest that you either burn the gas out of the carburetor or drain the carburetor so that the gas isn't sitting in there. The carburetor on so many engines is so small that it's just a tiny amount of gas and it can go bad so quickly. I've had even stabilized gas that um, that has not, I could tell that something wasn't quite right wasn't running sitting there good. in the carburetor. And so just do yourself a big favor. You know, if it's stabilized, it's not going to gum up, most likely at least for a while in the carburetor, but it can still have other issues running rough and things like that just because it's such a small amount of gas that's isolated. And so that's what I would say is do that and save yourself a lot of headaches. And I've had almost no fuel issues with generators or any of these kinds of things because I've pretty rigidly adhered to those rules. Yeah. And it saved us a lot of grief. And when I haven't, the few times that I haven't, I've run into uh, challenges sometimes. Now, having said that, any uh, any tank that I have stabilized with PRIG or D, if is other than a carburetor, that's such a tiny amount of fuel, I feel like it doesn't count. But if it was at least a five-gallon container, I've never had one go bad on me so far. Hmm. So that's, that's good. just a, a tidbit there. And yes, you can use stabilizer with, with two-cycle uh, two mix. It's not a problem. Stabilize your fuel. And then when you add two-stroke mix to it, you know, it's it's it just... It mixes just fine. Yeah, it's just fine, just fine. So anyhow, that's that's a little bit about um, stabilizing fuel, storing fuel for, for long-term. You know, like Lisa mentioned at the beginning, fuel is not the ideal from an independent standpoint. And so I would strongly suggest that anything that you're using fuel for you have a independent backup for that where you could do it another way. But why go through all of that? <laughs> I mean, chainsaws, the amount of work that it would take to replace a chainsaw is pretty incredible. Yes, we have a crosscut saw. Do I want to use the thing? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, a little bit of elbow grease in there. <laughs> that's right. And a 55 gallon drum of gas can go a long ways with a small engine. Yes. So, Sure can. I hope that was helpful, though, on uh, fuel storage. And if you have any questions, send them in to questions at thereadylife.com. And also, please, uh, it's super helpful if you can share the podcast. If you've appreciated it, share it with somebody else. Send them a text with a link to the podcast. Leave a review on whatever podcast app you're using, especially Apple Podcasts or Spotify one of those major ones. If you leave a review there, that's super helpful. And But especially sharing it with, with your friends, that's incredibly helpful in getting the word out. We want as many people as possible to be benefited by this. And we really appreciate your help. It makes it all worth it. And we appreciate you for joining. Hope it's been helpful. And we'll see you next time.